I'm very happy now to introduce the moderator for this evening's panel discussion. Paul Henderson is a great friend of JCRC. He's a past digital trip participant and a Freedom Sater attendee. To see you all at the Freedom Sater, by the way. Paul is Deputy Chief of Staff and Public Safety Director for the Mayor of San Francisco. He is also a highly sought after legal and political analyst for MSNBC and CNN. He frequently speaks and writes on topics related to race, the diversity, and the law. We are very fortunate to have him with us this evening to moderate our panel discussion. Welcome, Paul, and thank you. I always love the nice things people say about you when they're not under oath. So. <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Anderson, uh, and I, I love the contextual story that we all started off with, uh, that you shared with Forum and Esther, so I wanted to make a revelation as we got started. I'm black. <laughs> I just didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable, and let's get it out of the way, and let's talk about it, uh, because it shapes some of the conversations that I think we're going to be talking about uh, today and right now and this evening. Um, and I'm really excited that so many of you have come to spend your evening and your free time talking about something that I think uh, is intimately important, not just for the city, but for the nation as well. And we're really at a flashpoint right now in talking about a lot of these issues. Uh, this is one of the topics that I lecture and write about, uh, whether or not we are in a post-racial society. We have a black president, we have a booming economy, we have a democratic political process. Uh, and, and what does that mean? Does that mean that we have evolved beyond slavery or beyond racism or beyond a lot of the issues that I think this country has struggled with in the past? And where are we now? Uh, normally I speak for two to four hours, I think I'm down to three and a half more minutes. So get ready to write fast. So all the stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from San Francisco, and I think it's really important to talk about San Francisco. I'm fourth generation uh, from here. Uh, I grew up uh, in the Tucson Estates here. I know it's Double Rock Project, but Tucson Estates sounds like such <laughs> strength-based uh, interests. So uh, I'm from the Tucson Estates, uh, and, and I grew up out here uh, and became a prosecutor. My mother was a public defender here in the city. And I talk about San Francisco so much uh, because I think it's really important and it provides such a snapshot and a realistic perspective about how communities of color are treated throughout the nation. And oftentimes you hear people and they talk about black people, but it's beyond just black people. But I think that black people represent so much of disenfranchised communities in general, and that's why I think they're referenced so frequently. So when you look at the statistics of incarceration rates, of education shutoff rates, of impacts from justice reforms, uh, you talk about black people, but they track at the same rate as the Latino community, and even at the same rates as some of the Asian community, when you talk about the Latinos and the Hmong community uh, and Samoans. And so I just want to say that because I think people sometimes can distance themselves from the conversation by saying, like, well, that's just black people. Uh, it's, it's bigger and it's broader than that. But I think they are representative of disenfranchised communities in general. And that's why I wanted to say it and talk about it before we have this discussion. And let's talk a little bit about black people here in San Francisco, the city that we're all meeting in and talking about, where African Americans represent 3.9% of our population here in San Francisco. I, I'm the last one left in my entire family uh, living in the city. And when we look at our criminal justice system and we see that more than half of the people that are incarcerated are African American. And what does that mean about our criminal justice system in the city that is liberal or in the city that is supposed to be progressive. And that's what we're going to talk about here uh, this evening. Uh, and in terms of the post-racial analysis that we're having here, this conversation that we're about to have, I always think it's interesting, and I like to talk about 
uh, what is in the news and what we're talking about, not just in San Francisco, but as a nation. So when I tell you names, uh, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner, uh, Freddie Gray, or the unrest in Ferguson, or even Black Lives Matter, is there anyone in this room that hasn't heard one or several of those names and understand what they mean? And to me, that's none of you are raising your hands, and to me, that is the proof that we are not in a post-racial society. That is the proof that as these incidents come up and they make their way through the news feeds, that there are national discussions talking about how can these incidents still be happening when things are recorded, when things are brought into the justice system and the outcomes are surprising to the majority of the nation regardless of race, <coughs> to me, is the answer to the question of are we in a post-racial society because we are not, I don't believe. Uh, and from a San Francisco perspective, I, I think what's really interesting in talking about what's taking place on a national scale and framing it on a local scale is something that's happening throughout the nation that communities of color and disenfranchised communities have been aware of instances like Freddie Gray and Trayvon Martin and Ferguson for many, many years. And this is the experience that we are exposed to and the experiences that we experience. Uh, I can ask you all now, how many of you have been arrested at least more than a dozen times? And I'm the only one raising my hand. I, I like to frame some of my conversations just by letting audiences in general know, and these are things that I used to not talk about, but I think they're important to talk about, especially for the conversation we're about to have. I've been arrested eight times. The last time I was arrested, uh, I've been arrested for fair evasion or burglary or robbery. The last time I was arrested was at gunpoint for a gang homicide while I was a prosecutor. I mean, these are the experiences that I think people have in this country in modern times. And so that's a reality. And that's why we're having this discussion. And I think these cases that we're seeing in the news shine a light on those experiences. And yes, it does happen to people that look like me. And yes, it does happen to people that may not look like everyone that's in this room, but in communities across this country. And I think what's really important before I sit down and introduce our guests and start talking about these important uh, topics, here's what's important, that all of you are here and having this conversation and understanding and learning about these important issues of race. And here's the thing, and here's the thing that I want to leave you with, is that you can't fix what you can't talk about. And while these might be difficult conversations, that was a good quote, that was yeah. a good quote. <laughs> <laughs> so while we are having this conversation, uh, you know, I, I want to ask you to do one thing for me is based on the conversations that you're hearing, based on the insights that you are about to hear from this esteemed panel and the questions that you're asking, and ask the difficult questions, please, that you share them when you go home and you meet here with your family, with your friends, with your peers. You can put your conversations, you can put this experience on your Facebook page, on your Twitter feed, uh, and talk about it so that other people know that you think that it's important. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have all of the answers, but you'll never get to the answer if you don't raise the questions. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our very, very <coughs> esteemed panel. Uh, you are really going to be impressed with the folks that are here today um, because I want to introduce all of them to you and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, I'm going to give some introductory remarks, tell you a little bit about their background and who they are, and then I'm going to let them speak, and you're going to be able to ask them some questions. Uh, I'm really excited just because I know a lot of these folks uh, that are here on this panel, and I know their work, and I can't wait to showcase their insights uh, with all of you as we have this very important conversation. So I'm going to start off with a very good friend of mine, uh, Latifa Simon. Now, Latifa Simon is the program director for the Rosenberg Foundation. 
which seeks to change the odds for Californians through statewide grant making to support policy change. She was previously the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in San Francisco Bay Area, and before that, she served for 10, 11 years as the Center for Young Women's Development, CYWD. She was the executive director, and, led to, and that led to the creation of San Francisco's first reentry services division under then uh, direct district attorney uh, Kamala Harris. And I worked for Kamala Harris as her chief. Uh, Latifa is a friend of mine, and it's not in here, but I'm just going to tell you as well. She is a MacArthur Genius Fellow, and I really <laughs>
I'm really excited to hear. It's, it's on, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm really excited to hear from public defender Adachi, and I really want to purchase this book tonight. Um, so, um, like Paul, I'm from San Francisco, and I was born and raised here. And in preparation for this panel, we were asked to address a number of questions, like 10. And um, I don't think that time allows, but so I wanted to tell a story and hopefully provide some nuance. One of my dearest friends, who's also a colleague of, of Jeff's, is Alicia Garza. And uh, Alicia um, has a Jewish father, who was raised in Marin. And the day after the verdict came in, uh, with the death of Trayvon Martin based on that jury um, and, and, and his murderer, his murderer was set free. Alicia wrote a letter on Facebook to black people. And you could friend her or go on the Black Lives Matter website and read that letter. It was all love and encouraging folks of the diaspora to look at ourselves and to ourselves but because we were not and we will not and we may never get the authenticity of love from this structure, seeing as to how we came here. But she asked us as a, a young activist, she's just made 35, to look ourselves in the face, and put mirrors to our children, and to urge us to see ourselves, our flesh, our blood, our, our bones as mattering in this place. And then Patrice Colliers, a young, amazing, queer woman slapped a hashtag on it. But see, the movement for black lives has been intrinsic since 1619, and some would say before. The survival mechanism that we've had to just be here, to survive, knowing that we weren't supposed to survive, it's the, the terror, um, the, or the racial terror. And so, you know, the question that was posed to me to talk about as a sort of still an organizer and an activist in this moment, um, the, the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement being launched here in the Bay Area, I want to push back on that and say this movement came so much. It was, it was this is a movement of, of hundreds and hundreds of years. The difference in this moment is that young people who are queer, who are white, allies or Jewish allies who are Asian for allies. There's an organization in San Francisco called Asians for Black Lives. Like people understand if in fact freedom can actually be tangible, that the least among us must be free. And so if my life and my children's life does, do, does it matter in the face of criminal justice, no one else does, right? Like we can't get to a moment of peace and space if the folks who are brought here um, in, in chains don't see justice. And so that letter where she encouraged us to come together unapologetically black, unapologetically African, and disrupt, not only disrupt spaces, but for us to also think about getting rid of respectability politics and how we engage in the conversations of race. It's not okay anymore just to get in our Sunday best in March. Maybe we do have to take over a bridge, as they did in Selma, right? Like maybe we do have to stop business as usual because as long as black bodies continue to hit the floor, the cement, we can't live in peace. I want to be clear, especially to folks who are new to some of these conversations about police violence and the impunity of it. I was growing up here in San Francisco, one of the most revolutionary and liberal spaces. We are all children of the 1968 student strike at, at San Francisco State that created ethnic studies. But as a 39-year-old woman hanging out with friends as a teenager, we knew that if we saw the police in the Fillmore and they stopped us, whether we were walking or driving, someone was going to get hurt, regardless of what we were doing. That, that is what we grew up with. That's what my grandmother grew up with, right? from Malvern, Arkansas. So many of us share these stories, but racialized terror still lives so deeply within the context of young black lives. As I finished the story, when I began working in the criminal justice system, 
as an employee, I was in the criminal justice system, juvenile justice system as a young person here in San Francisco. I stole clothes, and thank God for Jeff and Patty Lee. Um, I made it out. And <laughs> I'm a good citizen, um, but I was poor, right? So you know, young children, like the street children in Brazil, they do what they need to do to survive, and they make the best of what they have. But when you go up into juvenile hall, and you go into 850 Bryant, I think it was Patty Lee, who's the head of the, the juvenile division, uh, for the public defender's office. She called me when she learned I got the job and she said, like Juvenile Hall, 850 Bryant is the blackest space in San Francisco. We still live in a city where we jail young black kids for fighting in school. We put them in concrete cages. We don't do that unilaterally for, unilaterally for white children, we don't. Patty also told me when I was doing organizing with young women, the judge, no matter what the race or space, the implicit bias lies so deeply within them, they not only look at the child, they look at who is in back of them. We don't jail children who are not black and brown and poor for acting out. We don't push kids out of preschool for stealing Skittles unless they're black or brown or poor. In the city, we have so far to go. The Chronicle three years ago uh, placed an article called Thanks But No Thanks. And it was about folks coming into schools and interviewing for kindergarten and looking at black and brown faces and leaving out and saying thanks but no thanks. In the diaspora of San Francisco, we have less white children in our public school system than any other public school system with an equal population in the nation. The racism in this city is extremely visceral. So, I'll finish my story there. It's so beautiful to be able to share with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Latifa. Uh, and now I'd like to hear from our public defender, Jeff Adachi. Thank you very, thank you very much, Paul. Um, that was beautiful and inspirational. Um, it's, it's great to be here tonight. It's, it's just, I feel like I'm on Oprah or Dr. Phil or something. It's, it's a great space. I didn't know this space existed. Yeah. And all of you being here uh, tonight, because you care. This is an issue that means something to you. And all of you uh, who come from the Jewish faith, the tradition and history, you understand institutional racism. You understand how an entire race could be annihilated. And you understand genocide. And when you look at the history of this country, and there's really two points I want to make, is that race has always been a part of the law from the very beginning. Right? We had laws that justified slavery that said that only, for the most part, white males had rights. The Constitution was not meant to include people of color. And the same thing is true of the California Constitution. And whether you start with slavery, the Jim Crow laws, the exclusion of Chinese, the uh, incarceration of my parents and grandparents, along with 120,000 other Japanese Americans during World War II, the genocide of over 100 million Native Americans, the use of Latinos as essentially slave labor, labor through the Bracero program. And you could go on and on. And I think, well, you don't want to dwell only in the, the pain and the death and the sadness and the negative, that it is that history of struggle that in a very unique way has united people, not only now, but from the beginning of time, to work together to effectuate social change. But again, as, as Paul said, the first realization has to be that race is a reality of our lives, even in a progressive city like San Francisco. I would like to tell you that as public defender, it's not true that if you're African American, you're four times as likely to be stopped for a traffic incident. Does that mean if you're African American, you can't drive? If you are arrested, you are six times as likely to be arrested if you're African American and be taken in and charged with a crime <laughs> than if you were white. 
That's true. For, <laughs> for a drug offense, you're seven times more likely to be arrested. Now you think, oh, does this mean that more African Americans are using drugs? Actually, no, that's not the case. According to every study, including the you know, National Institute on, on Health, that, that the national organization that measures this, whites per capita use more drugs than blacks. If you look at the overdose rates at all the hospitals in San Francisco, you will find that 60% of the people who are there for drug overdoses are Caucasian, not black. Yet, if you look at drug offenses, 60% of the people who are arrested for drug offenses are African Americans. Even marijuana offenses, when they were enforcing those here in San Francisco. Now, I'd like to say that it stops there, right? Because we have learned judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys. And by the way, I see a couple of my brethren here. I see Lisa Katz, who's deputy public defender, and Frank Lehman, um, prominent criminal defense attorney in San Francisco. And when you look at what happens outside the system in terms of how people get into the system, and you look at what happens, let me just tell you one quick story that I was told in confidence by a judge. I'm not going to tell you who he is, but he's a state judge. And so he was at a uh, convention uh, for judges and, and a meeting. And they passed out a file of an individual. And it had a rap sheet in there with a criminal history. It had an incident report. And everything was identical to each of the files, <coughs> except for one thing, the picture. One had a picture of an African American. The other had a picture of a Caucasian. And so they asked the judges to do two things, set bail and to sentence the person based on the allegations that were in the report. He said when they all pass it in, that it was amazing and it was incredible what the results were. Consistently across the board, the bail was set at 20 to 30% higher for the African American and the sentence was about 30% more. And he said the room was a speechless and they vowed never to talk about it again, but he told me that story. And I'm sure Professor Glazer is going to talk a lot more about implicit bias and what that means. It is not to say that this group of judges wakes up every morning with the idea that they're going to sentence an African American person or a person of color to more time, but the reality is that they do. And while that is terribly depressing and awful and horrible that that happens, um, that's the starting point that we have to recognize that that's the reason why we have one million African Americans in prison. Do you know, in, in, in the whole time that we had slavery in this country, there were about 450,000 slaves. Yet today we have a million. And again, looking at history, one of the things that often isn't known is that after slavery, there was an effort in almost all the southern states to increase the penalties for minor crimes, which allowed African Americans to be incarcerated on a mass scale, and then they were used for cheap labor, right? This is the so-called, you know, uh, chain gangs. And if you look at the Jim Crow laws, these were laws that were enforced and that people did time. And so when we think about how these laws <coughs> have supported racism and how you know somebody like a Bernie Madoff, right, who you know stole hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, uh, uh, dollars from people, was out of jail. Yet if you're in this country in charge of the crime and your bail is five hundred dollars and you can't afford it, you will be in jail to dependency of the trial. So there are structural problems within a system like that um, that we can identify and talk about. But again, two things we gotta remember we have that tradition of racism in this country, and secondly, it's manifesting itself every day in a criminal justice system. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Glazer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I'm really resentful that I go last because <laughs> all of the notes that are in my head have blown up. Um, I was been said in a, in a good way, and so I'm able to actually hone in on, on a smaller set of, of topics. And in fact, Roni, is it? Um, 
I was checking off items in my head as you were going because uh, I wasn't going to talk about Quorum in particular, but I was going to talk about the high rates of incarceration in the United States of African Americans. And, um, and, and then to hear about um, the particular statistics and the stories around uh, law enforcement experiences of people of color in the U.S., which is something that I study, but in a fairly intellectual way, um, brought it all around, and it reminded me that um, the other day I was uh, on a panel with uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and she, on racial profiling, and she was talking about her own experiences, and in fact, striking experiences for a sitting Congresswoman who at the airport is sometimes told by other travelers that she might be in the wrong line uh, if she's in the express line. Uh, just spontaneously volunteering that information to her because she looks like she's in the wrong place. And my feeling was, well, in fact, this book, this book that Paul mentioned, the, the two critiques of it are, one, the font is too small, and two, uh, Jack Laser can't relate to people of color. And I, I completely caught to that. I, I, I don't try to understand fully what that experience is, is. and yet as an as a academic and a researcher, the statistics are heartbreaking. And so that's where I, that's my comfort zone, looking at graphs and numbers and crunching numbers. The statistic that the Bureau of Justice Statistics calculated that 32% uh, that of black men born in 2003 would should expect to be incarcerated at some point in their lives. That's devastating. But with all of the collateral effects that result from incarceration, loss of employment, loss of future employment opportunities, loss of finances, uh, voter disenfranchisement, all of these things, health effects, the disruption of their families and their communities, um, but that number is absolutely untenable. And so that's how I relate to it. Uh, so as Paul revealed to us that he's a black man, I'm admitting that I'm a white man and a Jewish man at that. Uh, and so I relate to it in this way. But I do want to say, I wasn't going to say this, but I want to say something about my personal history, uh, which is that I, I study, I, I went into social psychology to study prejudice. That was my purpose. And because I, I learned that that was a, a uh, discipline that had the theories and the methodologies that I felt were superior to others and were particularly effective. One of them, as it turned out, after I made that decision, was this research on implicit bias that has proven to be so helpful, although also so troubling. The reason I wanted to study prejudice was because my father, the rabbi, was a civil rights leader, and my mother was a Holocaust survivor. And those two things, and my father, by the way, was inspired to pursue the rabbinate by a black Baptist minister from San Francisco named Howard Thurman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the roots in my family go to that. And, and in fact, he went on to work with group, lots of uh, stigmatized groups and oppressed groups over that time. And so this was an inspiration for me. And I, I pursued it in my own cold clinical sort of way. <laughs> pardon, pardon me. Um, so let me talk about racial profiling and implicit bias because that's specifically what I've been asked to talk about. Uh, racial profiling, I think we all have generally a sense of what it is, but I want to define it uh, as uh, the use of race, ethnicity, or national origin by law enforcement officials to make judgments of suspicion. Whether they act on those judgments or not is another matter, but merely using race as, or ethnicity or national origin as a basis for suspicion raises the probability that they will, that they will intervene with somebody's life as a consequence. Uh, we do make an exception both in the law and in the, re in the research for cases where race or ethnicity is used as a basis for a specific suspect description. And there are people who make compelling arguments for why that sh <coughs> should actually be included in racial profiling, but I don't. Implicit bias is are the biases, the stereotypes, and the prejudices that reside in our memories uh, that are outside of our conscious awareness and control. And they are influenced by the media and our conversations with people, and they are also influenced by news media reports of crime, which tends to over-report crimes by people of color, and also just over-reports crime, generally speaking. So these biases, th th and, and let me just 
be perfectly clear, the science is 100% certain on this subject. The, uh, and, and the reason for that is that the social psychological research on implicit bias has evolved from cognitive psychological research on normal human cognitive function. How we perceive things, how we uh, store things in our memories, how we retrieve things from our memories. It turns out that most of that is done automatically, effortlessly, and implicitly in the sense that most of our memories we don't have any subjective awareness of. When you see a friend, you don't have to think what their name is, the name just pops into your memory. That's implicit, an implicit memory being automatically activated. Well, that's, that's true for our, our memories about people who belong to specific groups that we have prior associations about. It's very difficult to overcome. And so my main message is that now that I have been studying this mostly in the realm of policing, is that we know from social psychology that stereotypes and other kinds of biases are most influential when people are making decisions under uncertainty and in conditions of ambiguity. And that's when our minds fill in the gaps by solving, giving us these shortcuts to figure out. And when we're interacting with other people, we never have complete, you know, we actually rarely have very good information at all about what's really going on in their minds, what they're planning to do, what their motives are, what's going to happen next. And so we're trying to make inferences about that, and we and we make those inferences based on theories that we have, implicit theories that we have about what people like that are like. Men or women, people of color, white people, Jews, Catholics, Muslims. And so what ends up happening is that when people have a lot of opportunity for making these judgments and a lot of discretion in making these judgments, the, the information is more ambiguous and more uncertain. And that's my final point here is that, for now, is that uh, law enforcement in the United States operates with a high degree of discretion, not the good kind of discretion, the ambiguous kind of discretion. And police officers can stop pretty much anybody they want to. And because of that high discretion, uh, they end up stopping people of color because that fits the stereotype of who's, who's uh, likely to be involved in criminal activity. And I can say more, my, my time's up, I can say more about the specific processes that give rise to that later. Um, but I want to thank you, and I want to thank the panel for indulging me. All right, so while our panelists have been talking, many of you have been submitting your questions, and so I'm going to frame some of your questions and present them to the panel. Uh, panelists, you should have uh, microphones with you. I'd encourage you to use them so we can all hear your answers. Uh, I'm going to throw the first one uh, to you, Mr. Adachi, uh, and that question is, how can we address issues of social justice while holding police accountable for bad incidents without completely alienating them and eroding their credibility completely? Uh, and then just to contextualize this question, uh, there's a comment that the individual feels like there's a need to address racial justice uh, but still have a need to support those that protect us. Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, I'm, you know, probably uh, not the most popular person with police. <laughs> <laughs> Being a public defender is sort of unique in the sense that it is our job, in a sense, to protect against government abuses. That if you have a prosecutor that's overzealous, if you have a, a judge who is committing misconduct, a police officer who is abusing his or her authority, uh, who else but the public defender uh, to raise these issues? Because it's our job, in a sense, to enforce the Bill of Rights. Right? That was the document that uh, the dissenters of the Constitution came up with and pushed through because they felt that the Constitution gave the government too much power. But to answer that question, um, the challenge that you have with police is that they are human beings, so they're going to be subject to the same biases that we all are. The good news, though, is that you can, and I don't know if, if Professor agrees with this, you can, you can untrain people on their biases, and that's part of what we need to do. Now, to a certain extent, it is automatic, right? If you're part of your brain, the amygdala, the, the, the fight or flight, the, the, the part of your brain that, brain that reacts to danger. 
uh, is going to react a certain way. It's such that if I'm a judge and I see a large African American man and I'm saying bail, I'm going to set up a higher bail because I'm afraid of him. And I don't understand why I'm afraid of him, I just know that I do. And this happens. This happens. And it doesn't matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter uh, you know, how many books you've read on the subject, you're still going to react in a way. So what do we do about that? What the, at least some of the studies that I've seen around neuroscience shows is that, at least as far as implicit bias is concerned, that if you are made aware of it, that there is a self-correction factor. And in the example I gave you about the judges saying bail, they did another study where the judges were asked to sentence individuals, and they then told the judges not only about the disparity, but they told the judges that there was a monitor in court that was keeping track of the dispositions. And they found that, magically, there was a self-correction factor that occurred. Why? Because the judges suddenly became aware. And that's why one of the things that we are pushing for in terms of police reform, we have a race of justice committee in the public defender's office starting in 2013, is that we are keeping track of all the outcomes. Before in San Francisco, they did not keep track of who they're arresting only for traffic violations. And so now, uh, thanks to Supervisor Malia Cohen, there's a bill that passed over the summer that requires every quarter the police department to uh, report on not only who they're arresting or detaining or stopping for traffic violations, but what nationality they are, what their background is. And so that's, that's very important. The other thing that we've been pushing for is what we call implicit bias training. This is something we started in our office about three years ago. And I was very resistant to it because I said, wait a minute, we represent people of color and our staff is 40% uh, people of color, LGBT. We don't need this kind of training. And I was found out was very wrong. And so we've started to do uh, actually a, a half day uh, implicit bias training uh, every, every year. And it's something that um, you know, has, has made a huge difference because whether or not you're a prosecutor, a police officer, or a defense attorney, um, you're going to be affected by the biases that you have. So you might not fight for a client as hard if you hold a certain bias. So those are some of the things that I, I, I believe uh, are within our reach that so we could change. Thank you. I also you. respond. Yeah. Please, Paul. Yeah. 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 Because what you made me think, again, two stories real quick. There was a young man at age 50 Bryant. So we have a jail there. A lot, I always forget, a lot of people haven't been in that building. There's a big old jail, um, and then there's a lot of courtrooms, and it's our criminal court system. And you actually see our elected public defender actually trying cases, which just doesn't happen whether you're an appointed or an elected, um, and so we thank you for that. Um, there's a young man who was wrongfully being questioned by police while he was awaiting court, and a young public defender now that I'm in my late 30s, everyone's young. <laughs> so I was a young organizer, everybody over 30 was old. Um, and it was one of just PDs. Jamie, tell us. And you talk about how we, how we confront these deep systems. It, it is individual and structural. She got in the face of these police, and if you Google tonight her name, you'll see her taking an arrest for defending this young man's right not to be bulldozed by police while he was um, moving through his own legal processes. So individuals, how we step in, regardless if you're an attorney or if you're an individual seeing racism. The second, question, um, second story I, I want to tell is, again, growing up in San Francisco, we live in a dynamic, beautiful, very diverse city. I have a good friend, white girl from Lakeview. She became a cop. We had this conversation about six months ago. We are no longer friends because what she told me, and again, the police department continues to get grants from DOJ around broken windows theories, right, around, around those kind of interventions. So what that means on a daily basis, and Hunter's point, we have police officers, and how many unsolved murders and rapes do we have in San Francisco and home invasion robberies? Well, we have police officers putting bikes up against walls, waiting for poor people to take them. Right? We call it these by bus. Right? They do it with crack cocaine, they do it with bikes. And she told me about an arrest, a double arrest that day. It was a Latino woman who told her son, get, get on that bike. They were carrying groceries. The bike had a basket. Get on that bike. Two people were arrested that day. 
that little boy who was 11 years old and his mother. His mother was undocumented, okay? So, like, right now, in this moment, right, when we talk about implicit, but there's also explicit bias and how we procure funds to police our communities, like, you can't tell me that any way justice was served that day. In no ways, right? And so, really, in our police department and police departments all over, we're, this is not Mississippi, but many of the ways in which the men and women in blue patrol our streets, uh, they have some of the same methodologies about, again, who, who is not worthy of, 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 of their own human rights, right? That mother who told that child to get on that bike to go home, we spent a lot of money incarcerating that child and that mother. We have to challenge folks <coughs> like Greg, who's a good dude, but to push and think differently. How he hires, how he trains, and our police commission to continue to fire cops who do work um, that is unjust and that doesn't follow um, our, our constitution. All right, can I just weigh in for just a minute? Because both of you said things that are very poignant and pertinent to the science. Um, Jeff, on your, on your end, uh, you know, one thing we, we don't know how to do right now is to untrain implicit bias. Uh, so most of the training is focused on raising people's awareness of the potential for it to affect them. But just as implicit bias is a normal form of human cognition, we can't just maybe go away. It's more of a generational prospect to change the environment so that people are not relearning the same biases over and over. But you also pointed out that when people expect to be held accountable or to have their judgments held to account, they're less likely to make biased judgments. And that's something that's borne out in a lot, across a lot of different kinds of studies in a lot of different um, situations. And um, they, I'll just leave it at that. You can leave it at that, but that leads us into our next question. I, and I, I just want to add that in terms of addressing that accountability, I think one of the things that's really important is having uh, an inclusionary agenda across the board beyond just the public defender. Right? So it's not just the public defender that is holding bad behavior or questionable behavior. We have to do a better job of having an inclusionary agenda for prosecutors that review those police reports and make decisions about what gets charged and how things go through the criminal justice system. And then ultimately, on the bench. We have to have a bench, in my opinion, obviously, uh, that reflects the community in which it is designed to serve in terms of evaluating and making conscious decisions about those things as well. But this leads us into our next question, uh, and, and you raised the issue just uh, a moment ago, Jack. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys to limit your responses to two minutes so we can get through some of these questions that people want to have answered. Um, and this question is for you. Uh, I think you brought us there uh, in closing of the last question. Assuming that implicit bias is inevitable at this point, or factually existing, what policies and procedures are necessary to mitigate the effects of implicit bias in the criminal justice system, in your opinion? In two minutes. <laughs> Solve it. <laughs> um, that's a great question, and uh, the, the main distinction I want to make on that topic is that as I mentioned, we, we can't un, we can't de bias people with implicit biases, and that's not for lack of effort. There are there are laboratories across around the world trying to figure out how to do that right now, and the, the evidence is quite clear that we can't do it in a meaningful, lasting way, and that's because it's normal cognition. But we also go right back into the old environment, and we get be trained on what the biases are. So we can't do that. Uh, but what we can do is try to in, mitigate the impact of the biases on the decisions. And that comes through increasing accountability and it comes through reducing discretion. So if police officers are encouraged to make a lot of stops and a lot of arrests. They're going to have a low threshold for suspicion. They're going to stop a lot of people. And what you see across the country is that most stops by police are unfruitful because they're wrong most of the time. Their judgments of suspicion are highly inaccurate because it's an ambiguous situation and they're using mental shortcuts like stereotypes. If you reduce the number of stops that they make, their yield rates go up. They find more contraband and more weapons and the racial disparities go down. And there are a couple of very compelling case studies where that really is overwhelmingly the case 
And the general tendency is you get sort of a triple win where police are acting more efficiently, fewer people are getting interfered with in their daily lives, and the racial disparities are, are reduced. And the overall contribution to those horrific statistics of high rates of incarceration for people of color are also mitigated. Thank you. There's a lot more of it. No, no, no. But two minutes. You did it. Great. <laughs> We're going to get through these questions. People are like, I wrote these questions. I want to answer. You are all going to solve racial disparities tonight. I'm going to help. All right. Latifa, this is a question for you. What can we do as ordinary citizens to advocate for racial justice in our criminal justice system? In less than two minutes, tell us. I'm going to do 45 seconds. Okay. There's a young brother named Raj Jedidev. You know Raj. He is a, a, a South Asian brother from San Jose, and his new work is to radicalize and popularize how we think about jury service. Um, and I have tried to get every single jury. Um, we actually have to figure out. And Rob, he's a young revolutionary through the criminal justice reform. But I think he's got it. They do participatory defense work in his organization. They tell these Freudian stories um, to, to the jury about the full person who does need some accountability in their lives, but don't we all? But one of the things he wants to do in communities is organize and tell the stories of why we need to be in that process. And it is not enough that we have finals or that we are poor, but to take time out and be a part of the jury process. And for folks, for the brilliant defendants who say, you know what, I'm gonna, we're going to take this to trial. Um, he wants to push and also press young defendants um, to have their real day in court and to stop pleading out. So there's many different ways we can do it, but serve on juries and also call out racism as we see it. Um, and the way in which you do it is when you go into court, you can actually go into one of the courtrooms and, and actually watch on your day off. It'll be very fun and depressing to see pregnant women in chains, right, for drug offenses in this city. But to see it, you have to see it, you have to touch it, um, because the, the fact is, is MSNBC and CNN, they're not going to give you that, that, that context until you see folks still in the most progressive city on the West Coast locked in metal cages for non nonviolent crimes with def defense attorneys who have 200 cases and are giving their best um, and a system that they can't get into a CSU, but there's a bed waiting for them. We figured that out. No matter what you do, if you commit a crime or if you are arrested and not charged or can't pay bail, but you're sitting up in jail, there's a bed for you. Um, and I think we have to see it and feel it to be able to have the rage that is visceral and intellectual to be able to move. All right. All right, for our, our final question, and then I'm going to have uh, comments from all of the panelists. And this one is for you, uh, Mr. Dachi. Uh, according to the San Francisco Chronicle, there are only 250 African American high school seniors uh, in San Francisco, with the presumption that there are more that have dropped out of high school, and those are the only ones that are active and in school at this time. Uh, and at the same time, as a juvenile public offender, uh, this question comes from an individual that uh, has indicated that at least 75% of their clients were African American. How can we address this disparity? Yeah, that's In two minutes. <laughs> that's, <clears throat> that, that question is very much on point because if you look at San Francisco in particular, we do have a segregated school system here. In San Francisco. If you look at the um, rates of children of color versus white children in private school versus public schools, I mean, you might as well have segregated schools. In terms of education, if we don't provide a quality education, we know what the outcome is. The outcome is, is that you're going to either be not always, but often, a victim or a perpetrator of crime. That if you look at educational failure and who fills our prison, there's a direct correlation there. Now, it, it, it's not to say that you're going to be defined by your community. Obviously, that's not the case. I mean, Latifah Silent. I mean, it, you know, everything that she's achieved in. She's running for elected office. She's running for for Harvard, and I could say it. He could. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and, and Paul is running to be a judge. And we, we have how many African-American judges on the bench in San Francisco? Is it five? Four. Four. <laughs> See? And so with 83% of people of color coming through right, the storms, but. Right. And so it's like one of those, you know, what's wrong with this picture? But I, I do think that you know we have to reprioritize uh, where we're spending our, our resources and that if you look at uh, California in the last 10 years, we've built nine prisons and one public university. And that's why it's so expensive to go to school. We're spending more money on corrections, on incarcerating people than we are on higher education. But I, I really feel that the battleground for this is the school. Paul mentioned that I made a film called Racial Facial. It's only an eight minute film that covers the history of racism in the US. It's 450 images and videos we put in this one film. And so I made this with the idea of going into the schools where these incidents are occurring. You might have heard there was an incident where uh, they had six girls who had the N word across their chest and roll. Black History Month, there was an incident where they had a sign of prominent African Americans that said gang and SI. There was a wiggle party <coughs> where white students were uh, dressed up as stereotypic blacks. So this kind of thing is happening in our public schools. And this is part of what I think we need to do is to get these messages out there um, and get the science out there too. It's interesting. Thank you. Jack, I'm going to start with you in terms of our closing remarks, and I'm going to give you one minute to solve these complicated questions. But I want to ask you, and I'll start with you, if you could wave a magic wand, what singular policy change would you make, uh, either locally or at a state level or even at a federal level, uh, to reform our criminal justice system? I feel trapped as a public policy professor. I should have a ready answer for this. Um, there's no one single. I would, I would like to see. Let me help you frame it. Which, which, yeah. which policy do you think would have the most impact well, if we were able to focus on right, the top <coughs> priority? So, this might sound strange coming from someone who studies implicit bias and sort of made a career of that. Uh, but I don't think implicit bias is the problem. Uh, the problems, and this is what I was going to refer to earlier that Latifa brought up, the problems are structural. Uh, and they are baked in to the structure of our society, and they exist in the utter inequality of opportunity. And it becomes a vicious cycle, so they get manifested in policing through implicit bias and through explicit bias and through bad deployment decisions about you know, concentrating officers in certain neighborhoods. They get manifest in that way, but, but the cycle perpetuates because uh, as the inequities persist, the ability to transcend them is not there, and the biases get perpetuated. And, and you can see I've, I've done some research showing mathematically how this happens. The police focus their resources on certain groups. Those groups will be incarcerated at higher rates. And then they'll point to the statistics and say, look who's committing the crime. And so you know, I think to the extent that we can break that cycle, uh, this is really pie in the sky, but providing the kinds of resources and putting more, more investment into education than into incarceration. Those are the kinds of things. The other one little thing I would say is we need to change the jurisprudence on policing because currently the benefit of the doubt goes to law enforcement. And uh, off the, the Supreme Court has essentially said they don't care what the actual motivations of a police officer are as long as they can point to a valid legal pretext for a stop. And in that environment, you're going to see this continue to proliferate. So that would be my one major policy change. That's a very good point. Very good point. Thank you. Jeff, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question and allow you to answer more broadly. Uh, what do you want this audience to take away from tonight uh, about how the United States understands and deals with race and incarceration? I think In one minute. <laughs> I, I think three things. Um, one would be that we look at our own lives and we diversify our own lives. One thing that was very interesting, when we showed the film at Lowell, one of the Caucasian kids said, well, I don't hang out with any black people because my parents don't hang out with any black people. And although they preach equality at home, I don't see that in their circle. And I'm sure if you talk to the parents, they would not say, well, we make it a point not to Associated with black people or Latino people. It's just that we 
feel more comfortable, or we, by happenstance, contact uh, our contact with, with, with white people rather than black people. But that's really where it starts from. And if you don't have that sort of diversity in your home, you can't expect it of your children. There's been studies that have shown that it, babies don't discriminate until they're about nine months old. And that's when they begin associating with different, uh, with, with kids that are more of their skin color. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. I think the second thing is to talk about it, you know, to talk about it, uh, in forums like this, but talk about it amongst your friends. One thing we have to train our lawyers how to do is talk about it during jury selection. And jurors are bringing it up. When jurors in San Francisco are knowing there are no African Americans on the jury veneer on the entire panel, people are saying, hey, how would I feel if I was in, in that position? And I know I'm out of time, but, but the, the third thing that I would do, and this might sound like crazy, is write about it. Okay, write about it, talk about your experience, don't think that you can't add to it because you know, you're not black or you don't have an opinion. Because when you put it out there in the stratosphere, you are adding to the discussion, and that's very important. Thank you. Uh, Latifa, I'm going to let you take either one of those questions and answer in one minute. Either, what singular policy do you think is most important to focus on to addressing these disparities that exist? or the single thought or feeling that you want this audience to walk away with from tonight's conversation and discussion? I'm going to make up my own. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here, folks. <laughs> um, as I was sitting here listening to my comrades on the panel, I was thinking about, again, growing up in this great city and you know, going to Claire Lilienthal Elementary from um, and Priscilla Middle School and George Washington, and having this kind of this very, very, very complex uh, diaspora experience of, of of who I spent time with, um, I was a very young mother. I have a 19 year old daughter, and her life is very different than mine in many different ways. And I think about her. She's very fair skinned. She's very different. Well, often called the nanny. But I, 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 how much she in charge? What do you mean? This is my child. But I see now the world through her eyes. And in my daughter, now we are somewhat middle class. I smelled weed in her room like last week. <laughs> and she's pretty bad and she does well. But if she was raised on the street that I was raised on and was caught with her friends and they party at Berkeley and they have such a great time, my friends were all in the juvenile and the criminal justice systems for the exact same things. A good, what I will leave you with, and there's so much, we could do like a week long high labor training session on all of these issues, but a good mentor, his name is James Bell. James, he runs the Hayward, uh, W. Hayward Burns Institute on racial equity and juvenile justice here in San Francisco. Um, he said, tell people when they're asking about these issues, if it passes the, if this was my child test. If this was my child and they were caught fighting in school, would I allow law enforcement to slam them to the ground and put their face in the dirt and put them in the police car? Absolutely not. If this was my niece and her, both of her parents were murdered before the age of eight and she was caught fighting on the bus, would we stand for her to be put in foster care because her grandmother couldn't take care of her? Like, would we stand for that? If these were our children and we made up 3% of the population in San Francisco, which 70% of the foster care system post the war on drugs, what would we do if this was my child, if this was my niece, if this was my nephew, if this was my mother, if this was my father? We can see criminal justice reform in that prism. Of, of taking ourselves into those spaces. And we would absolutely, if these were our children, and I've worked with young people for 20 years, but I don't know what I would do if my child had, had to mirror what some of the young women that I've worked for, I, I don't know how she would stomach it, going to the California Youth Authority at 13, far away, and living in a concrete cell, or being, and I know I'm overtime, last thing, or being 16 years old 
and being pregnant and being at 375 Woodside and being a black girl and taking a general hospital to give birth for her, to her baby and that baby being taken away from her. And she goes back into 375 Woodside after she was handcuffed to the bed while giving birth. This happened 10 years ago. I was there. We stopped that policy. A lot of the public defenders and juvenile uh, justice system and some young people organized and we changed that policy. But these are the things that if they were our children, we wouldn't stand for it. But for the children like the widows, like the widows who have no guardians, we have to be the guardians for the children and for the oppressed. So when we're struggling, just think about our children and how bad they are and how they deserve nothing but love and how they're doing the very best with what they have. Let's create a new justice system that is really about redemption and transformation so that when people come home, there is truly a beloved community for them to come home to. That's aspirational, but that is what policy making is about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, panelists, and I want to thank uh, all of you for being here. I think the real enemy or the real issue that sustains these types of racial injustices that we've all been talking about is apathy. And so I really want to thank the JCRC for putting this panel together, for inviting all of us here tonight, and for all of you for taking this step and coming here and listening to this conversation and spreading the word about what you've heard. I think if we really want change, if we really want to address some of these problems and challenges that we have in our society, we cannot take a preparatory approach to changing these things. We have to have change with intentionality. We have to take affirmative steps. And coming here, I believe, is one of those steps uh, I wasn't supposed to answer the question, but I'm just going to answer it anyway because I've got the microphone. <laughs> but I think that you know we're at a really important flashpoint right now in this society and in this city, and becoming active in whatever way that means to you is really important. That we must do something, and doing something is showing up and doing jury duty. Doing something is writing a letter. Doing something is voting and asking your neighbors, are they registered to vote, and encouraging them to vote. I, I think right now, while we're having, if we turn on the television and you see the discussion about uh, Super Tuesday and the elections and the things that are going on, and this is something that just stands out so broadly to me, and one of the candidates, and I'm going to repeat the name, is saying, let's make America great again. <laughs> and, and the question that it begs for me is, Make America great again for whom? Because I don't feel like that statement speaks to the broad audience of this country. And it doesn't speak to the broad audience of this city. And it doesn't speak to the values that I think that we as a country represent. And the only way that that is going to change is if we don't sit on the sidelines and watch it unfold and watch these things and hear these stories and hope it gets better without working individually with intentionality and sending our dollars or sending our votes or sending our thoughts or sending our concerns to elected officials and to neighbors and to peers to make a change. And so that's what I want to leave you with. I welcome you and I thank you all for being here and paying attention. And I thank our panel for sharing these wise insights. I hope we leave here with a broader understanding not just of what the problem is, but what are some of the solutions that we individually can take in order to make a change for the rest of society and for our children and our future. So thank you all so much for your time.